And they said, Shamisa is free at any time to join the platform of Poland tomorrow if he wants to. Poland! Ah, uko ati endo. Now I mimu kada kundi endo kuno chamba kuinda muheri sa damu chekwe. Kandi na nyura ndambe zwane ngwe na kuno zoto wa itambi na muvizi momo. Muvizi na ngwe na rumba pindi kuno kupa uska zivi. There is one leadership, one party and one goal. But there may be individuals who may feel that they are not aligned to the collective vision of, collective vision of the party. <laughs> Welcome to this edition of the Free Talk. Now this week we are going to be joined by Advocate Nelson Chamisa, the President of the MDC Alliance in his chambers. We are going to be discussing the issues around Nelson Chamisa, Ahana plan, Anayoyere plan. Does he have a plan? Does he have a political party? And what are the issues that his political party, if he has it, are dealing with? Now, here on the Free Talk with me, your host, Dara Blessed Mtlanga. We get into the issues. Join us just in a moment as we have a conversation with the MDC president, Nelson Chamisa, in his chambers. Thank you, uh, President Nelson Chamisa, for joining us here on the Free Talk. Now, President, can you just briefly, uh, let us look briefly at the future of Zimbabwe or where Zimbabwe is right now. What is your view about our country at the moment? Well, I must say that the future is very exciting. The future is bright and the future is solid. It is solid because we have a solid citizenry. We have solid people, hardworking people, peaceful people, committed people, um, people who are uh, conscious of their great country. We have a beautiful country, a great country, 
a country if all uh, supported by all our efforts as a people uh, on account of our different core competencies will be able to do extremely very well and i see zimbabwe as the switzerland of africa if not better uh, uh, not just for africa but for the whole world so yes the prospects are very high where we are is a bit difficult we are in a, a very difficult spot on account of a deficit of leadership when you say deficit of leadership but you say we are the switzerland of africa how do you how, how do you balance that how do you reconcile those two uh, starkly different statements. Well, I've always said we have everything we need in this country from the natural resources, the human resources, uh, the character and content of our you know, populace, our people. All the things we have here are very good, including the climate. The only thing we ha don't have and we need to correct is leadership. So that deficit of leadership is what is the you know, important spark that will propel us into stardom and into success, and that is what we need to correct. You know that we have been uh, sweating under a, a very a contested political situation out of the 2018 elections. Um, the illegitimacy factor has been affecting our country because people chose a leadership, but the court decided uh, for the people who the leader is supposed to be. So that disconnect is what is causing problems for our country. And that's why you find that Mr. Mnangagwa cannot inspire the population in the nation because he does not have the will, consent, and support, the legitimate uh, consent of our people in Zimbabwe. And that's why we have a problem. So we need to correct the leadership question. But you say that uh, we have seen new roads are being uh, built in this country. Um, the president is always up and about opening and commissioning I, I, new I, projects. Are you sure you are seeing well? Because, see, don't mistake uh, an attempt to maintain a road as a new road that is being constructed. You know, maintenance of a road is a simple function of any serious government. And it cannot be something that people have to really uh, harp about and to go to town about. We need real motorways. We need a construction of spaghetti roads. I've not seen any. If anything, our country has gone backwards. You know, in terms of the kilometers of roads that we had that were tired, tired. We, are, we are actually seeing that the roads that we have now are exhausted, tired, and potholed. Mm. Most of them are not just dust roads now, they've even become, you know, almost um, uh, rivers, so to speak. George Haramba, who's the presidential spokesperson, has put this blame on the road squarely on you because you control uh, local authorities, and it is in local authorities that we've seen so bad roads do you take responsibility for that? Well, I want to just debunk this, this false myth, this fallacy, that the MDC is in charge or is in control for local authorities. We were elected by the people to lead local authorities, but we are not in control and in charge of local authorities. Why? Because our local authorities are affected by the command structure of our politics. Central government controls local authorities. How? The central government dictates the budget. Even if residents are consulted, ultimately the signing, the authorization of the budget is done by the Minister of Local Government. It is the Minister of Local Government who is responsible for the recalling of even councillors, caters of whatever political party would have then asked that the minister does it. Mm -hmm. It is the Minister of Local Government who is in charge of the local government board, which is responsible for hiring and firing senior officials. It is the Minister of Local Government who is also in charge of the ministerial directives. So the issue of the absence of devolution is affecting the decentralized nature of local authorities and their ability to articulate the programs and the activities that are supposed to be done. So what we need to do is to make sure that we move from this command control structure to a devolved structure. A devolution becomes then our next revolution and that is why we have said if there is no revolution in terms of central government being uh, you know taken away from local authorities and local authorities being liberated from central government we will continue to have this problem so just the issue of the accountability it is not the mdc that is ultimately accountable it is central government but beyond that roads are actually under zinara 
And you know that people pay money to Zinara, and it is Zinara that is responsible for roads in this country. But are you, recounting, are you recounting your statement because just after uh, the elections, you, you sat there and said to the nation that you control most of the urban local authorities? I'm not recounting. Yes. We control in terms of the leadership. But like I said, we were given the mandate. We are not executing that mandate because the control has been taken away. So why are you in that space? It's, we are no longer in that space. You know that uh, now we have ZANU PF and the other creation, the ZANU PF light, that are now taking over all the councils. We are actually contesting this to say we need a revolution, a reform of the local government laws in terms of the Urban Councils Act and the Rural District Council so that we give autonomy and devolution, the powers, the authority to our local authorities. That has always been a bone of contention and it's one of the key reforms that we are going to institute upon you know, assuming the reins of authority, not so distant the future. You, you have said this in a n number of times. The other time you were saying at Shike 2023, um, we are going to change the leadership in this country, but we're just two years down the line. Have you failed to deliver your promises? Look, we will not get there. I still insist. You know, you may think that we get the change of leadership. It's not just change of leadership in the physical sense. Change of leadership is those who are now in charge. If you look at the turn the, the of events in this country, the tone of our politics, you, you, can, you cannot doubt who the leader is. We are the leadership. That's why ZANU even responds. They behave like an opposition. And they've arrogated us and elevated us to be the leadership. It's, it's, it comes, but we have responsibility without authority which has been our problem in local authorities, where you said, you know, I said we, we control. Indeed, we, we got the support of the people in 28 out of the 32 local authorities. But if you look at it now, because of the problems that I indicated, it's no longer possible, it's no longer tenable to continue to do that. So more importantly, in terms of what you are saying, yes, I would say that things are going to change. And things have started changing. You just need to look around. You look, listen to ZANU. Every day, they are celebrating that the people are coming from the MDC Alliance. Why? Because they know that we're the real game in town. Every day, you hear them blaming us. Why? Because that we are the ones who are able to turn things around. We have the capacity in terms of leadership, in terms of the teams we have, to change things. But how do you say that you have ca the capacity, you have lost the, the leadership dispute in the MDC? And now the MDC... Where have we is, lost it? Now the MDC is led by Douglas Monzora. Which MDC over. are you talking about? Don't, don't confuse the MDC. You are talking about a, a, a ZANU-PF creation. We, we are not interested in that. ZANU-PF has created its own opposition. It's shooting its own straws. But they're the that ones is, in parliament. They're the uh, ones who look, are... You can be in parliament, you can be in heaven, you can be wherever. It doesn't matter. We are with the people. We are in the house of the people. For us it doesn't matter. ZANU can create its own opposition out there. They can be in parliament, which is created and controlled by ZANU. They can be in local authorities. That does not affect us. At the end of the day, we know that this battle is going to be sorted out. But your organization has been disintegrated, hasn't it? It has actually strengthened. We are so excited that bad apples have been flushed out. I mean, who would celebrate having a basket full of bad apples? And when those bad apples are gotten rid of, you must be proud. And we are so excited. Some people say your party doesn't have a name, it doesn't have an address, it doesn't have the, a place. The to... party. So why would you come to a party that does not have a name? Why are you even talking to a, pet, a person who is leading a party that is nameless? Don't listen to ZANU. They will corrupt your mind. They give you a lot of rubbish. And this is the rubbish that I'm now getting to say, ah, look, the party has no name. Don't listen to them. What? Look at what the people are saying. We are the only game in town. We are the people's choice. We are the next in government. We have been chosen. That's why you see even in the region, our stock of support and legitimacy has been increasing. We are acknowledged and recognized as a key player globally and internationally. Not out of conjecture or guesswork, not out of accident, but because we are the only game in town and the only game on the continent in terms of articulating the next generation leadership and politics in this continent. There's one issue that has been strong, uh, strongly coming out that... But I hope that you are answered because, you know, you were under the impression that, you know, the party is nameless. It's not nameless. 
What the, is the name of the party then? The party is MDC Alliance. That is the name of the party. We contested in elections as MDC Alliance. We were voted by the people as MDC Alliance. We asked for votes from the people as MDC Alliance. We went into parliament as MDC Alliance. We went to court contesting the election result against Munangagwe and Zanu as MDC Alliance. We even got our allocation from the political party's finance as MDC Alliance. They knew us. They know us. They will always know us as MDC Alliance. The fact that they've not been able to handle us and that they are trying to deconstruct us does not necessarily mean that we are de deconstructed. I can tell you that you will find us with a proper name distinct from any other names because we can see that they want to bank on the confusion. You know, give a name, another blessing Mushanga there. This is blessing Mushanga. This is not the blessing Mushanga. You, 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 you don't get confused. Because it's not about the label and condemning that is being done by Zanu PF. It's about who we are. And so we when, know our identity. So when you say we are going to have a distinct name, can you give us pointers? Is the why co should, why convergence? Should, why citizen? should I give pointers to even our detractors in Zanu? Because that's what they want. Mm -hmm. That's why they've been saying Chamisa Tipe plan, Anna plan. Okay, you do know, you have a plan? Do, do you think I'm like a, a, you know, Samson who goes to Delira and is told, please give us your, where your strength is? I'm not. Samson, I will not review the plans. We have plans, we have strategies, we have tactics, and that's why we are the, the ones that are standing in the country. Mm -hmm. Do you think that we'll be standing with all the budget? In fact, ZANU PF have invested so much money, more money than they've really taken into, into education, has been given to or deployed to attacking and destroying the people's projects. But they will not succeed. We are so excited that all their attacks have actually turned out to be very useful fuel to propel us to the next stage. But do you think that a political plan should be a secret that is only known to a political organization? How will the people buy into that plan? Why are you plan? saying it's a secret plan? If you're not going to say it, then it's a secret. It's is it known not? by our people, by our structures. They know where we are going. But what we will not do is to share and trade secrets with our opponents. That's not our business. They can ask for a plan, they will not get it. Those who believe in us, those who understand us, those whom we are leading, understand where we are going. There's a formula to our approach, and that formula is understood. Are you worried that most of your cadres, or those people who were in your organization, are crossing ship and joining the MDs, CT, and ZANU PF? Where, where are you getting that? Just last two weeks ago, ZANU PF paraded people at its headquarters who said they were MDC Alliance. But do you know that ZANU can actually parade monkeys and convince you that they are donkeys? So why should I respond to rubbish from ZANU? We're not interested in that. I mean, they brought Chiroto and other people who left the part way back. They actually contested under different tickets. The MDC Alliance only participated in 2018. They were never members of the MDC Alliance. They were members of the MDCT. But you know, this is very funny. When they want to blame for whatever they think are the uh, excesses or weaknesses in local authorities, it is Chamisa's people. When they want to recall people and want to give accolades to their own people, they belong to the MDCT. When they want to say people have actually uh, deserted that party, they are from Chamisa's party. But when it is a question of acknowledging which party is the leading opposition, no, Chamisa doesn't have a party. Don't you find it bizarre that they would want to parade people at state house uh, wherever they are parading them? Did they parade them when they joined the party in the first place? But it tells you that it is all propaganda meant to destroy the confidence of the people in the people's project, but they will not succeed. What is your response to all this, uh, President Chamisa? It, uh, it looks like you are being overwhelmed by this alleged bludgeoning on your... I told you that, uh, relax, we are, not, we, are, we are so clear about where we are going, my brother. We are so clear and let Zimbabweans know that we are solid on the ground. The movement is growing. We are everywhere. This year, we said we are going to focus on five critical issues. The people's agenda, the reform agenda, the alternative government agenda, the global agenda, and more importantly, the citizen convergence agenda. And all those aspects are significantly flowing. 
we are anchored in the people on the people's agenda mobilizing people across the whole country at rural level rural strategy making sure that we embed our party in communities providing leadership at a community level and we're so excited about it reform agenda we are pushing a prize campaign which you have seen around the elections, principles for a credible election, and it's going to roll in, 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 in full force very soon. We are happy with the convergence. People are beginning to converge. We want citizens to converge and build a new consensus, a new agreement, a new way forward, and a new convergence on where we are going, the promise that we need for transformation. But you've been accused of saying a whole, this whole stuff that you say and not actually delivering. You, when you challenged the presidential elections, you assured the nation that you had V-11s and you were going to prove your Indeed, case. Indeed, we had V-11s and you know that. Don't listen to propaganda. The, Why? Courts, the courts said you didn't. Well, but, but the courts are not the ultimate arbiters of the reality on the ground. The V-11s were provided, but they said that we don't want to listen to the V-11s that you have provided. You know that very well. And we wanted to provide a subpoenaed uh, um, server that we want, wanted to prove the fact that we actually won the elections. The courts rejected that one. It was not admitted. So what else do you want us to do? The so, problem is not with us. The problem is with the view and the interpretation of the courts of what we had. And it has nothing to do with that. We had all the V-11s that were supposed to be provided. So you're saying the court was against you? Of course. You know that the court did not. That's why they ruled against us. They didn't agree with us, but we had all the V-11s that we needed to show. And I'm very excited that our you know, advocates, the legal team, did a fantastic job. They did a fantastic job. Far from this illusion that uh, we didn't have evidence, we had everything that we needed to prove our case. Mm -hmm. And we just had to take just some of them to prove that we actually had a case. But from, an, from listening to you, it means that the system is totally against you. Now, how are you going to win when the system is against you? What hope is there for you? But do you, do you know that in all dictatorships, it's always that institutions of the state are manipulated against those who are out of it. But we have examples. Look at Zambia, look at Malawi, and elsewhere where dictatorship has fallen on account of people being resilient, on account of people understanding that their institutions are ultimately patriotic and are ultimately very credible and independent and professional. And that is the situation here. Wait, watch the space. Are you saying our systems will be professional in 2020? Look, I've always said we count on the men and women in uniform to do what they know is their constitutional duty, to support the will of the people. At the end of the day, when people have voted, they have a duty to salute and respect what the people would have determined. But, but, but we, have, we have seen that this has not happened. Look, that's, yes, it has not happened. Yeah. And if it doesn't happen, once beaten, twice shy. It's not as if we don't know what we are doing. President Emerson Nanga was on record saying that what happened in Zambia would never happen here. Is that, that not a warning to you? Uh, have you not seen that Mr. Mnangagwa has suddenly become a victim of uh, the demon that attacked uh, Ian Douglas Smith when he said not in a thousand years? That demon attacks everybody who, who occupies a position in this country. President, so what do you want me to say when Mnangagwa is hallucinating? when he said by 2030 he's going to be there, when we all know that he won't be there. President, there's an aspect of poverty. Sure. That poverty delays the attainment of democracy in a country. Now, are you worried about the issues around poverty, poor payment of civil servants? It's extremely worrisome. In fact, just today, I did a tweet, um, a whole thread around poverty. You know, my worry is that I was looking at the Pisces report and the World Bank report that over 50% of the Zimbabweans are actually exposed to poverty. And they've actually had their circumstances worsening. You know, if you look at teachers, for example, you know, they're earning, and most of the civil service, less than 30,000, you know, are teachers, which is almost slightly above $100. But if you look at the, you know, uh, uh, basket of a family of four, it's almost about 45,000. It tells you that they are subsidizing. We have poor workers. We have people who are going to work who are poor because they can't even make ends meet. So I'm extremely worried. Poverty in the civil service, poverty uh, in the working class, and poverty in the general uh, uh, populace, particularly in the rural areas, is quite a worrisome point.
And this but I can the... tell you that yes, it's a challenge because people are vulnerable and exposed, but we are doing everything within our power to conscientize, educate citizens so that they are able to come out of this and understand that their only solution is to clearly and emphatically vote for change so that we win in numbers with a magnitude of uh, landslide so that we're able then to uh, deal with the problems that have been affecting our country. This poverty has been blamed on you by the ruling class. They say that, especially, I actually saw a tweet from Joe Charamba which points at you as the person who called for sanctions and the person you're buying tomatoes from is a victim of your sanctions. Well, I must say that, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Zanu PF and Joe Charamba for giving us a lot of uh, uh, power and authority. Uh, they are convinced that we are the only ones who can talk to the international community. Uh, and I must thank them for that. That's, that's a, a, a bill of, uh, uh, you know, uh, confidence in us. And that, that's appreciated. But beyond that, we, we differ with them. We, we have never meant anything that is against the dictates, uh, interests of our country. In fact, the biggest sanction we have here in the country is corruption. Look at the corruption that is there, which has become a national religion. Everywhere, every corner, every sector is buffeted by corruption. You look at fuel, there's corruption there. People go to the reserve bank, they get money at the official rate, which is about 85. But when they sell the fuel, have you ever seen fuel being sold at any of the safe stations in the RTGs or in the local currency? Oh, US dollars. So what are they doing? when they are selling it in US dollars with that extra. The arbitrage, the rent-seeking activities, the auction system has become a form of corruption where you find people go there for racketeering purposes. They get money from there instead of then using it for export purchases, uh, uh, import purchases and for, for whatever they're supposed to do as exporters. They are going to trade at the local market, okay? At a rate of about 150, 160 on the black market rent-seeking activities, creating artificial billionaires and millionaires. That is a big problem, and that has to be sorted out. It's a fertilized ground for corruption, and those are the challenges we must be dealing with. That is the sanction we must be dealing with. Corruption has become endemic. Look at gold. In gold, wages disappear, uh, just one person at airport. What has happened to that person? No arrest simply a catch and release. Now they're free. The other one in South Africa, you know what happened? So those are the issues we must be dealing with. This whole thing of uh, accusing the MDC, we are at the forefront of saying, let's correct our issues so that we're able to confront the problem that we are facing and approach the international community, having ticked all the boxes that are supposed but, to be. But they're saying that it is you, it is your people who allege abductions. It is your people who go to the international community. Uh, like um, recently we had something from your vice president and IBD who was saying the IMF should not bail out Zimbabwe uh, because you allege that there are massive human rights abuses in this country. Do you think that those things do not affect this country well, negatively? Look, look but, but why are we abducting people? Are they being abducted because the government refuses? But there are people who are there who have been abducted. There's evidence there. Why should we even talk about arguments? There are people who have been abducted. Why should we arrest our journalists? Why should we arrest our professionals? Why should we arrest the opposition? Why should we use food as a political weapon? Why is it that we have people who are being persecuted just for demonstrating? Why do we have our people being you know, violated and brutalized? Those are issues that are on the, on the table for us. And those are the issues we must be able to deal with. So this whole thing about Chamisa, this, ZANU-PF accusing MDC alliance, is all political propaganda. You don't point your finger at others when four of the fingers are pointing at yourself. Fix the governance problem, Mr. Munangagwa. Respect your people. Stop rigging elections. Respect citizens. But do you at those least, are the issues. But do you at least acknowledge that there are sanctions against Zimbabwe? Of course, there are sanctions invited by ZANU on account of their delinquent behavior, their truant behavior. When you, when you terrorize your own citizens and you want to have relations with a neighbor, 
The neighbor will tell you that, look, we are not going to do any relations with you if you are doing one, two, three. Your duty is not to argue or quarrel. It's actually dumb for Zanu to even go to Sadak to say, help us, you have these sanctions removed. The most important thing is to go to those people who place the sanctions. Have a conversation. What are the issues that you have problems with us? That's more than business. That's more than leadership and more than politics. This whole thing of wanting to be macho on everything. You don't use a hammer as a tool for every of your problem. Not every problem is a nail. So, what is, do you actually But wish? that point tells you that there's a fundamental problem in the country. The fact that we are even haggling or arguing about whether or not uh, sanctions were caused by this and that, that tells you that it's a crisis in the country. It's absence of a conversation. I've said to Mr. Mnangagwa, come, let us reason together. Let's have proper dialogue, not Pollard. But he has invited you equally to talk to him, and you have refused. I've said Pollard is not a legitimate platform for a conversation. Because it's created as a command and control platform. We are not a choir. We need a conversation. We are not pulled rules and puppets. We are principals and adults. We are citizens. Let's have a mature conversation. You can't have a mature conversation are. in that Pollard setup? I've told you that Pollard is completely discredited. Number one, you can't ask Mr. Mnangagwa to come as a prefect in a, in a conversation and a dialogue where he's supposed to be an equal partner. That's where it is wrong. It's a wrong platform. We need honest umpires, respected statesmen who are able to scaffold the process, possibly international players in the region, former heads of state, to be able to, to deal with this problem. And I've said it over and over again on behalf of the people of Zimbabwe. Let's have an honest conversation around the issues affecting our country. This whole thing of creating platforms and inviting people to your own platforms. Look, there is mistrust. There is a lot of suspicion. If we are not able to deal with those issues, we will not go anywhere as a people. So, some have accused you of trying to have a big man mentality to say you can't sit in Poland because there are other small parties. When you are looking at me, do I look like uh, I have that mind set of a big man? I believe that we must have a dialogue of the equal partners, not just the political parties, but also the civil society, the church, traditional leaders, war veterans, youths, the students, women groups. Let's all come together, professionals. Let's have a national conversation so that we are able to have a national dialogue on the issues. But of course, as I say, it takes two to tango. There is a dispute that must be unlocked. That dispute is a 2018 dispute. Most of the political parties that are in Poland do not have a dispute with Mr. Mnangagwa. They agree with him. We have a dispute. The elections were not conducted in a proper manner. The elections cannot be conducted in a proper manner until we are able to have an understanding of the reforms that are supposed to be there. Even the 2023 election will produce another disputed outcome if we don't resolve on the reform issues on account of the International Observer Mission reports by AU, by SADAC, by COMESA, by the EU, by even the NDI and RI and the US groups that were here monitoring the elections. Mm. I want to take you to the constitutional amendments, President Chamisa. What is your view of those constitutional amendments that just happened in Zimbabwe recently? I told you that we don't support an amendment to a constitution that is not begged by the people, that is not begged by what is good for Zimbabwe. The amendments you saw are a project of elite pacting and a project by unilateralism on the part of uh, uh, Mr. Mnangagwa and his party. They did not consult citizens. That's why even in the consultations, people did not support the amendment of the Constitution. In fact, instead of amending the Constitution, let's align the Constitution, you know. Let's make sure that all the pieces of legislation are aligned to the Constitution so that we realize the freedoms, we realize the fundamental rights that the people have in the Constitution. Some, some say those constitutional amendments are meant to consolidate power and this puts 2023 way out of your reach? Well, I must say that they're trying. It's a sign of desperation. Authoritarian consolidation is Mr. Mnangawa's project, but they will not succeed. They will try, but I can tell you, we'll stop them in their tracks.
And that's why they are panicking. That's why you see they have been roughshodding from pillar to post, trying to destroy the people's movement. But we are indestructible. You know, they, we, are, we, we are indomitable. We are unconquerable as a people's party. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, watch the space. One of the major issues they touched on the judiciary and chiefly on the post of the Chief Justice. Do you see this affecting the way the people view the judiciary? Well, this is precisely the problem. You saw, you saw in 2018 that there was illegitimacy on the executive presidents. They disputed the election around the president and the executive. But what we have been seeing with the recalls in parliament, this is now illegitimacy migrating into parliament. What we have been seeing with the disputes around the issue of the Chief Justice is now illegitimate migrating and gravitating towards the space of the judiciary. It's not good for our institutions. When you have uh, leaders who preside over key institutions coming in a manner that is controversial, it tells you that something is wrong. Something is rotten in Denmark. Something is bad in Zimbabwe. And we must be able to fix those problems. But in as much as we are concerned about that, 2023 or any other election, once we have instituted reforms, I can tell you that the people will triumph and the people will succeed and the people's victory is certain. So what is your view about the judiciary at the present moment? Is it an independent institution? We need to do a lot of work to make sure that the judiciary is liberated from the control and command of politicians. But as a lawyer, you go to court why do you, con even the MDC continues to go to court and you view the judiciary as captured? Look, I must say that the courts have a duty to convince all the citizens that they are credible, they are independent, they are professional. And it is their duty because that is what is expected of them in terms of the constitution. Because they are a creature of the will of the people. They are a creature of the mandate of the people. So the duty of is showing that they are independent and professional, lies with the courts. And we have had problems with the interpretation of the law by the courts, and it's something that we are extremely concerned about. I want to take you to the recalls, President. Uh, just recently, your former chairperson, uh, committee, threatened anyone who is still in parliament, in council, who is supporting you with recalls by end of this month. Does that bother you? Not at all. You see, those whom the gods want to destroy first maketh mad. So when you see one of your own going berserk in that manner, in fashion, you can only but pray to God that they are healed and redeemed quickly. But you've lost many people who supported you because they felt that you are letting them down. What is your definition of loss? You had a number of people who were backing you as members of parliament. For instance, I'll look at Brian Dewey in Gweru. They were not backing me. These are popularly... Don't, don't, don't reduce people's issues into individuals' issues. The people of Zimbabwe voted for their MPs. And those MPs have been recalled. It's a violation of the will and mandate of the people. It's victimization of representatives of the people. It's a serious issue. It has nothing to do with Chamisa. It has nothing to do with the one who begs Chamisa. It is the people who were legitimately elected who have been victimized. And that is what we must look at. It's a significant signifier and indicator of the crisis that the country is in. When you have popularly elected leaders being withdrawn by those who did not even choose them and those who do not even have the mandate, those who are created by but you Support attempted them. to recall them first because I know that the time when... I'm, uh, not, I'm not aware of any time where we attempted to recall anyone. There was an attempt to recall uh, Morgan Komichi by, and, and by, by By your Secretary General, Charlton Wende. Well, look, I'm not aware of that. You sit yeah. there honestly and say you do not know that I'm your Secretary General... I'm not aware General of any attempt to recall anybody. I'm not aware of that. In fact, we never made a decision that we would recall anybody. For what reason? You don't recall elected people. You don't. You can, maybe, to some extent, recall those who are appointed. Like, you know, this very funny thing. I'm the one who appointed Monzora on bended knees. After he had failed to secure a seat as a member of parliament in Nyanga and in Highfields where he wanted to be a member of parliament. He then came to me and said, look, 
Mr. President, can you accommodate me on the list of proportional representatives in the Senate? Because I don't have where I would save the people of Zimbabwe from and under. I said, fine, that's fine. We had to convince Mutsekwa in Manikaland, because he's the one who was on the list after the provincial consultations, to actually step aside for Monzora because he was senior in the party. And I was at the forefront of doing that. Just like Komich, just like Mudzuri, after he had been defeated in Warren Park. And these are the people who are now pretending as if uh, they just came from Mars, you know, and they just uh, appeared and were parachuted from nowhere to be senators. We appointed them. But you know, borrow drops are very temporary. Watch the space. But Douglas Monzora has claimed that he has always beaten you at every election that you have called. Which election? We don't want to go into, you know, propaganda. You know, in 2014 where they claim, they know what they did. And I don't want to speak ill of the date. But they know what they did. Including the role of the state. When they released money on a night without following procedures from CBZ and the Reserve Bank. And that man was released to some people in the party as a way of stopping Jamisa. So this project of trying to fight uh, the people, uh, representatives, started way back. And we had a very deep conversation on this issue with President Tsangirai then. And he's, he was aware of these issues. And those people we are talking about, they know their duplicity in dealing with the state to try and destroy the people's movement. So I don't want to go into those issues. So are you admitting that MDC has been penetrated for a very I've long said, time. I've said that because we are a big organization, the bigger the size, the bigger the risks and hazards of infiltration. An elephant will always have elephant problems. A red will always have red problems. Size determines the size of your challenges. So it's something that I've said in the public, that we have challenges within the party. That's why you find that because we are a big party, a giant organization, we also have giant problems. But we have been able to contain and manage them because we are a big organization. Infiltration always becomes a real hazard and risk. And you have seen the evidence. I mean, when you have people getting open support from the state to take over illegally and criminally the headquarters of the party, and of course we are waiting for the Supreme Court to determine this issue, because that, you know, uh, that kind of act is criminal, flagrant violation of the law. We have not responded in a radical manner because we want to give peace a chance. But we'll get back everything that was taken away from the organization. When you say you want to give peace a chance, do you think you have an option that cannot be unpeaceful? We have options. We can take over the building at any time. If we want to occupy Harvest House, we'll occupy it. And they will, they will not be able to stop us. But we don't want fights, because that is what ZAN is counting on. We want the courts to be able to deal with these issues. If they fail, we will then have to resort to the measures that we know best to protect and secure the people's cause. And it will come. So we just wait for the Supreme Court to determine this issue. But I can tell you that Harvest House, we were occupying it as people were possessing it, but not out of ownership, because it is all owned elsewhere as a separate thing. It, it does not belong to the party. Now, I, I want to come to the issue where you have been accused of being immature. OK. Let's talk about that. Look, people must not confuse being young with immaturity, you know. You must also know that we have people who are in their ages, 80s, 90s, who are immature in dealing with issues. Look at how this country is being managed and governed. It's the inside of majority. When you find a person who refuses to move away from being a party leader to being a national leader, Mr. Mnangagwa, be national. Be a statesman, be a father, be a shepherd. He chooses to go back to his recesses as a crocodile in the party. We need a crocodile for the nation. He chooses to go back and be a crocodile in the party. That is immaturity. Immaturity is a sign of being unable to bring people together, to move the nation forward to heal the wounds of the past. Uh, do you think you can do that? Just give me a chance. Just give me a chance. One of the... So, so I hope that it puts paid to your issues. Don't be a victim of ageism. 
There's nothing wrong in being young. If you look at all the leaders who are now in their 80s, the octogenarians and nanogenarians in the 90s, when did they start active politics? In their 20s. Ask Mr. Chiwenga, when did you start to be active as a, as a leader within the army? Ask Mr. Munangagwa, when did you start serving in government? But this is what all the people who are incompetent do. They resort to ageism, they resort to sexism, they resort to other isms to try and disqualify others. Maturity is when you are able to understand that your country is more important than yourself. And you don't turn the country into a war zone like we have done. We must be celebrated, honored, and thanked for making sure that we don't resort to adventuristic tendencies against the will of the people. But the comrades that you used to work with, Eddie Cross, said that he left the party because... Is he a comrade? Maybe you could tell us. But you know, you know that Eddie Cross uh, has now tested the... Uh, uh, you know, the other side, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, Eddie Cross is benefiting a lot from this, this government with the projects that he has had, you know, his projects in Kwekwe, some I think in Vic Falls, then of course recently what he has just gotten, the second pipeline, no tender, no parliamentary processes, no accountability. So what do you expect from such a comrade who has become a victim of uh, uh, the politics of the feeding trough? joining that parasitic coalition uh, you know of 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 chronic capitalists and uh, greedy and selfish politicians that's where he is and 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 we must understand you know his appetite informs his warped thought processes but he says he wrote your manifesto in 2018 and you just threw it aside why did you do that uh, look we are not a neoliberal party we are a people-centered party we want organic connection with the people. We can't be an outfit of, the, of capital. We can't be an outfit of oppression or international imperialism. We have to look at where we came from as a labor-backed party, as a social democratic party. Yes, the role of the market is important, but there has to be the regulatory role of the state in the process. And we had fundamental differences on that aspect. So, but we had a fantastic, you know, manifesto for 2018. Let us look at COVID, President. What is your view in terms of how the COVID pandemic has been handled in Zimbabwe? A disaster. We must just thank God that we are in a space where we have not had uh, some worse disaster. But I can tell you that uh, we're not prepared. Our hospitals are below par. The ability to test contact tracing not uh, according to standard but we've just been fortunate that our God has really been on our side the, the, government. Va the vaccination that they are saying has been done fantastically well look you you can't have command vaccination allow people to have a variety of choices even what is being done to some of our civil servants why should you say that it has to be mandatory vaccination persuade people to be vaccinated there are other people who have conditions conditions that are actually worse if they are subjected to vaccination. You always have to understand that. I, I know I've received representations from civil you know, service, from teachers' unions, from everywhere. They are not understanding what is happening. Yes, let people be vaccinated, but let the vaccination be on the basis of a choice. Not just to say you have to be vaccinated by this simple vaccination you know, from this particular uh, company. No. But what would you say to someone who's thinking of vaccination right now? Please make your choice to protect yourself. Health is not something that can be outsourced. You can't have another person carrying your life on your behalf. So, yes, make that informed decision on the basis of the information that is there. Recently, government said that all civil servants who have not been vaccinated should not go to work. Now, how is this going to affect the people of Zimbabwe, if this is carried through. Is that's it a good thing? Th that's the point I said. It's not a good thing. It's all command. Command vaccination, command transport, command uh, agriculture, command lobola, command marriage, command politics, command vote. You don't run a country that way. 
You run it down. Gone are the days when you would impose things on the people. The future is collaborative. The future is a synthesis. The future is people in a conversation. The future is the citizens defining how they want and how they have to be governed. That is the difference, our difference with ZANU. This mono leadership, we believe in a multiple diversity of voices. Consult people. Even if you want to vaccinate, consult the workers. Educate them. The workers' organizations, workers' trade unions, representatives, teachers' unions, consult them. Look at the teachers now. No consultation impose. Look at the churches. No consultation impose. That is not how you govern in the modern sense. We don't agree with that. You need, yes, efficacious and effective decision making, decisive leadership. But you have to consult. As, as, we, as we close, President Chamisa, what is 2023 looking like for you? It's not just 2023. The future is bright. I can tell you this. We are, the, we are the only dealing in town. You go to the rural areas, you talk to all the Zimbabweans. They believe in our promise. They believe in our deal. They believe in what we have told them we stand for. And we have a track record. It's not just the promise. It's our history in the inclusive government. It's our history in parliament. It's our history where we have done politics. We are authentic. We have integrity. We are accountable. And we are not corrupt. But you know that the corruption we have seen in this government, as you know, the fish you know, rose from the head. There's corruption at the top, and it cannot be tackled. Look at all the deals. Wherever there is a corrupt deal, you always find those who are at the top in government. The best cars that are driven around are in government. Why? Because of corruption. Rent seeking behavior in government. Why? Because of corruption. Is it not supposed to be the case though, President Chamisa, that the best things should come from government? It's not the best cars and the most expensive cars to be driven by people in government. It must be people in the private sector. In government, it must be service and sacrifice, patriotism, professionalism, incorruptibility. That's what you must have in government. When people are in government to drive luxurious cars, then you must know that that government is rotten. And that is the situation we have in this country. And that is what we must fix. Are you saying that someone should be poor because they are working I'm for government? I'm not talking about poverty. I'm talking about not spending a lot of the people's money on expensive cars just for the sake of luxury. Government is not a place of luxury. It's a place of service and responsibility and accountability. So that is problematic. That mindset is wrong. I look at the president of Zambia going to the United Nations General Assembly on a, on a commercial flight. That's how it's supposed to be. Why do you need a jet? Why do you need these expenses? Why do you need to divert, you know, like what used to happen and what is happening? The entire plane, just for your own sake. When you are the president of a country, it doesn't mean that you are the only person. The nation has to benefit out of your service, service and sacrifice. So yes, we, we, we have fundamental problems with that. I mean, you find yourself in government and you are involved in corruption, in these deals, in, you know, you are involved in uh, racketeering. That's not patriotism. And we have problems with that. And for the people out there who want to know where you're taking this political party and where you can take this country, what do you say to them? Well, please come. Let us reason together. Look at our promise. Look at the deal that we are putting on the table. Look at our track record. Count on us. We did it during the inclusive government when we were just but half the government. What more if we are entirely a completely a separate outfit. This is going to be the best place, not just on the continent, but in the world. We have it with the best teams. You know, if you look at my economics team, the engineers I have, you look at the advisors I have across the board, constitutional law experts, we have the best team. But Kosanam says you don't understand the economy. Does he understand the economy itself? I actually am beginning to doubt if he does. Because you look, I would not be where I am without understanding the economy. 
in any event, it's not just Chamisa the person. Chamisa is a leader, but I lead a team. And I have fantastic economists around me. I have an economics unit that has been uh, coming up with our economic policies. And wait and see. Wait and see. And that's why we have also even engaged people like my brother Gosanamu. To say, if you have the best brains, come. You know, the president is not supposed to be an expert. The president is supposed to be a servant. But a servant who is surrounded by experts. That's a president for you. And this whole thing of thinking that you have to be an expert. If you're an expert in economics, so who is then going to be an expert in other things like mining, like engineering, like women's uh, rights? Or you can't be a master of everything. You can't be a jack of all trades. As a leader, you must have teams. And I can tell you that we have what it takes President, to set I'll, this country. President, I'll give you an opportunity to just look at the people of Zimbabwe and talk to them from your heart not from a scripted question from me, but from your heart. But I also want you to be able to address, say you have an opportunity to sit with President Emerson Dambuzomnanga, what would you say to him? Maybe you can start with that, and then you address the people of Zimbabwe. President Munangagwa, life is more than politics. Life is more than power. Think about the people of Zimbabwe. Think about the next generation. Think about a great nation. Think about the people in the rural areas. Think about those vulnerable people who do not have a roof above their head. People who do not have money in their pockets. People who have not been able to take a child to school. People who have not had a job. Some who are going to be reaching a pensionable age without even having worked. Think about these people who are jobless, who are penniless, who are senseless. We have nothing, we are hopeless. Think about people who are homeless. And when you think about them, see the reason to come together, to think about the future and leave a legacy. Why do you want to leave a legacy of destruction and corruption? Why? Let's fix our country. Let's work together. People of Zimbabwe, this is a great country we have. We thank God for it. We have everything, all the resources. We have great intellect, hard-working people. We are patriots. We can do it. We have populated the capitals of the world with our brains. Smartest people, sharpest people, peace-loving people, hard-working people. And of course, a great people, a fighting people, having won the liberation struggle under difficult circumstances. But because we delivered on the liberation promise, we can still deliver on the transformation promise. Let's do it together, you and I. Together, we'll be able to make this country a great country. And come, let us listen together. Convergence of all citizens for change is the only solution. And I invite you, join us to make history, to make Zimbabwe great. Young and old, let's do it together. Of course, remember to register, to vote. And we must actually defend the vote. And we must actually defend our dignity and our voice is possible. They did it in Malawi. They recently did it in Zambia. Of course, to borrow my brother Chinotimba, we can did it too. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, President of the MDC Alliance, uh, Nelson Chamisa, for joining us here on the Free Talk, proudly brought to you in partnership with the Frederick Newman Foundation. We always say that dialoguing and understanding issues, important issues around our country and how to tackle them is the best way to deal with them. Now, this is Heart and Soul TV and radio, the alternative voice, the place where everyone's voice matters. And we've been talking to the president of the MDC Alliance, the Movement for Democratic Change Alliance, led by Nelson Chamisa in his chambers. Thank you very much for your time. God bless you. God bless you, Zimbabwe. Remember, God is in it, and we are in it, you and I. Together, we can do it. Thank you very much, President. Thank you. We wish you the best. Thank you. This was the Free Talk, proudly brought to you in proud partnership with the Frederick Newman Foundation and Heart and Soul TV and Radio. We believe that dialogue is the crux of development. When people talk to each other, when people listen to each other, development happens. On Free Talk, we believe in political dialogue, economic dialogue, 
and social dialogue. Everybody must be heard. Everybody has a right to be heard. Free talk, talking that moves nation. Free talk, talking that makes a difference. This is the free talk. Thank you.